Okay, hi everyone, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, my name is Joyce Marcel. I'm a working journalist, and I'm also the president of a nonprofit, a small nonprofit in Brattleboro called Friends of Brooks Memorial Library. And I'll be the moderator for tonight's discussion. It's sponsored by Brattleboro Savings and Loan and presented by Vermont Independent Media, publisher of The Commons, an award-winning free weekly based in Brattleboro, Vermont. BCTV is our technical sponsor and they will mute and unmute speakers and take care of any technical issues that we have. Uh, before we go any further, I have a confession to make for the first few months of 2020, I thought the COVID crisis was going to go on for two months. And I was in complete denial. And I think that's how we all got through the past two years is by one month at a time. The other way we all made it through was this, Zoom. If it wasn't for Zoom, where would we be? So COVID has been a time of crisis for the nonprofit world. How many nonprofits shut their doors? How did groups meet or hold fundraising events when we can't be in the same room? Did funding foundations need to put their own survival over civil society? How can nonprofits build resilience? How did you reimagine your nonprofit to survive the crisis? These and other questions bring us to tonight's topic. Local nonprofit leaders share how they survived COVID and what you can learn from their experience. So I'm going to introduce the panel with us tonight is John Potter, the executive, wave John, there you go, executive director of the nonprofit Latches Arts and the for-profit Latches Corporation, the two companies which own, operate, and steward the historic Latches Memorial Building. Prior to that, John spent 20 years as a journalist in Vermont including 11 years as arts editor of the Brattleboro Reformer. Lindsay Fahey, hello, is a mission-driven strategist and community builder with 16 years of experience in strategy development and marketing. She's worked for the Adidas Group, Nielsen, the Center for Nature and Leadership, Strolling of the Heifers, and most recently, she held the managing director of community and impact role at Retreat Farm. Okay, Brett Morrison, there's Brett. He has worked in nonprofit fundraising and constituent relations for over 20 years for local, regional, national organizations. Currently, Brett works with the Connecticut River Conservancy, the 70-year-old organization that champions science-based water policy across the four-state watershed. He helps champion the rivers and streams protection, stewardship, restoration, and enjoyment. Next, we have Susan McMahon. There we go. The executive director of the Landmark Trust USA, a historic preservation nonprofit located in Dummerston, Vermont. Landmark is well known for owning Nalaka, Rudard e. Kipling's home, and the Scott Farm and Orchard. Prior to joining the Landmark Trust USA, she was the Associated Director at the Wyndham Regional Commission, and during her tenure, she helped numerous municipalities, neighborhoods, and nonprofit organizations succeed in turning their vision into reality. And last, we have Rick Cowan. There you go. Board member of Main Street Arts, Saxon River, the Nature Museum in Grafton, and the Grammar School. Most of Rick's career has been devoted to independent schools. Locally, he was head of the grammar school, director of admissions at the Putney School and the Compass School before retiring in 2015. So I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about the Friends of Brooks Memorial Library. We support the library with fundraising events, technology, advocacy, and programming. The library is a municipal library, which means its budget is approved by the town. So when the librarians need extra, they come to us. We're the fundraising arm. We pay, for example, the first Wednesday lecture series. We pay for Ancestry.com. We provide video streaming services, audiobooks, ebooks, 
We buy portable computers for library patrons. We buy museum passes to almost every museum in Southern Vermont and Western Massachusetts. So librarians who have to serve. So imagine how traumatic it was when the library had to shut its doors. But the librarians massively rose to the occasion. They joined Groundworks and Turning Point to provide laptops and iPads bought by the friends to people going into hotels for the first time. The reference librarian was available at home to answer questions. The tech guy helped everyone learn how to use their computers. And until we could do curbside service, we did delivery at home. We were active, as active as we could be during the past two years to make sure that the library remained the center of the Brattleboro community. And we're not very well known, but uh, we, we have done heroic work keeping people entertained and supplied with information during the past two years. John, I think we're gonna start with you now. For those who don't know about the Latches, its main operations are a 30 room boutique hotel and a historic theater. It's a hybrid organization, for-profit, part nonprofit. We know COVID was devastating for the Latches. I think we wanna hear your story. So why don't you go ahead? Thanks Joyce. Um, yeah, devastating is certainly the word. I remember um, seeing in about February of 2020 when COVID was still a looming thing that it was likely to affect the hospitality industries and the large event venues industries the, the most. And uh, that was the first uh-oh moment for me, really, really raised my level of concern. When COVID set in, um, the Latches lost instantly 96% of its income. Uh, but we did not um, lose our obligations toward maintaining and stewarding a historic building that needs a lot of tender, loving care and, and a, lot of, um, a, a lot of attention. So, so it was really a scary moment for us. Um, and um, you know, we would not have survived clearly without uh, the federal pay tech, Paycheck Protection Program and the state uh, various economic development grants. Those were able to lift us and sustain us um, but I want to talk about our, what our nonprofit um, group did. You know, how, how do you remain a theater when you're not open and you're not a theater and you're not gathering people together? Uh, that was a question that we put on the table at a meeting. And um, we, we decided then and there that, the, that what we really needed to do at that moment was um, just stay in touch with people, hold our community together. Uh, and um, think ahead very positively and optimistically to the time when we could all be together again. So we made a very conscious choice to dig into our communications and our, our just the, uh, holding the fabric of our community, however we saw it um, uh, fit uh, together and really focus on that. And I, I wanna uh, emphasize that it was not merely a, a strategic or calculated decision, it was also from the heart um, you know, nonprofit organizations are earnest, heartfelt uh, organ uh, organizations and entities. And we were feeling as individuals the same anguish and um, just terror and fear and concern and isolation that all of us, um, all of us were feeling as individuals. I think that's an important thing for people to remember is nonprofits are, are human organizations and they reflect the people that are in them. Um, so we, we, dug into our communications and, and um, we rebooted a weekly newsletter and uh, the focus uh, in the first months was on light communication and just staying connected with people. We didn't ask a lot of people that wasn't, we didn't feel that was appropriate. And um, there were other needs in our community and other things going on. We, we just wanted to stay connected and uh, put out, you know, what, what are your top 10 favorite movie moms for Mother's Day or what are your favorite baseball movies? And other conversational things. And the response uh, really surprised us. People were uh, delighted to get, get uh, the newsletter every week, the e-newsletter. Um, you know, how many people look forward to something that usually ends up in their spam box. But um, I was hearing from people that they really valued um, our efforts at communication and really felt uh, connected uh, to us. And so that was a, uh, that really got our attention uh, I think staying in touch with your community and nurturing it and fostering it is a crucial bit of work for a nonprofit that 
many nonprofits don't devote enough attention to. And uh, so that's a valuable lesson that we learned. Uh, we did other, uh, the other measures to increase communication on social media and a survey of patrons and uh, rebooting our website and things like that. And, and that really made a difference uh, so that later on we could come back to our community and, and say, well, now we need your support. And um, we found that our philanthropy uh, has increased during the time of COVID and that really helped us a great deal. Uh, the other thing that we really did as a, a pivot um, is uh, we launched a, a private theater rental program. Uh, and you know our theater reopened in June of 2020 and uh, audiences were very light. And I, I told uh, folks here that I feel like the guy whose date has just stood him up a lot of the time. Uh, we'd open the mo movie theater for a weekend and see two dozen people over the weekend. We were grateful to see them, but it was really, really tough. Uh, we launched the theater rental program in August of 2020, and we had no idea uh, how big a, a, a success it would be. Uh, silly us, we shouldn't have been surprised, but we are, this weekend we will hold our 600th private theater rental uh, since we launched the program, which is a pretty astounding thing. We've hosted more kids' birthday parties than Chuck E. Cheese's ever did, and um, we even had a marriage proposal happen during one of the private rentals where the, one, the guy asked uh, our theater manager to stop the film during a proposal scene and he enacted it uh, in real life, uh, having stashed the ring in a bucket of popcorn. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that story is great any, any time, but during a pandemic, it was really a moment of great joy. Um, the real benefit I think of the theater rental program, um, and again, it, it took us by surprise, or it was something that um, really taught us a lesson is it changed the way people think about going to the movies at the Latches. And we became part of people's uh, special events. We became a valuable lifeline. Um, we became, you know, we would get people's personal stories, which we never get uh, very rarely during a typical night at the theater where we're just glad to see you come see the movie. But we were getting these really uh, important pieces of people's lives and we could tell that we were making a real difference. and. Um, we know very clearly that the um, theater rentals are going to be a part of our uh, operations forever, for now and forever. Um, and again, it really um, bonded people to the Latches in a brand new way uh, and really taught us um, what's possible, what kind of uh, um, public response and connection is possible in our theater that, um, that in, an, in a new light. So, um, I think I'll leave off there, um, you know, hoping to emphasize that, that, you know, at least in these ways, uh, we're stronger now and going forward. We learned really valuable lessons or had important lessons re-emphasized to us. And, you know, the only way that going through all this is ever going to be worth it is if we harvest um, what we can positively out of it and make ourselves better. I don't just want to uh, drag myself into a new era like a survivor. I want us to to spring in as if we've uh, grown and improved. And, and I think those are some of the ways that we have. And I, I appreciate having the chance to talk about this stuff. Well, that's heartwarming. And a brilliant idea to rent out the theater. Were other theaters doing that too? Oh yeah, we stole the idea totally. Uh, <laughs> but, I think we, but I think we made it our own um, just by the way we operated it. And, and um, you know, we really said yes to almost everything that we could say yes to. If you wanted to come in at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning and um, and we could make it work, we were gonna say yes to that and and things like that. So I think we gave it our own particular spin. It was it was a challenge for us and it it, it ran us onto fumes, but um, you know, we remain grateful for it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, Brett, do you wanna uh, take it from here? Sure, thank you, Joyce. Um, I guess I, I would just start by echoing John's point about the importance of communication. And I think for me personally, professionally, and for CRC, that was reinforced. And I'll, I'll try to give a little bit of a sequence of how we had that uh, affirmed for us. And that was initially in March for, for our organization as a conservation organization, there's a lot of seasonality to it. Um, maybe a can a little bit to Lindsay in the retreat farm or even an apple orchard or I don't, it, it very is driven by the seasonal workflow. And, and really 
uh, January and February are a planning and assessment time. So January and February of 2020 were great for Connecticut River Conservancy. It had gone through uh, rebranding and well, for the organization was a very big effort to bring itself out of the community from the Canadian border to Long Island Sound over 2017 and worked through 2018 to do the early phases of a quiet campaign. That was going reasonably well. Uh, 2019, uh, I would say we, we probably stalled a little bit on the campaign without leadership giving. So there was a bit of a uh, needing to take stock, which happened at the end of 2019 and into 2020. But by the end of February, we thought, okay, we got a plan. We're going great guns into spring, summer. And then two weeks later, I had my last visit at the Community Foundation of Hartford, and they were all trying to figure out how to close the office. And that was just my, that was a Tuesday. That Thursday, I was supposed to be in Keene for a, a water cafe with our river steward and Keene people in the Asheville watershed. And, you know, everything evaporated. So what felt like a really well laid out plan disappeared. And initially, uh, this is where sort of the less about communication came from. We, we retrenched a little bit too much, I think. We, we had the luxury, briefly, of pumping the brakes on fundraising. We're not, we weren't needing to gear up for a, a gala. Uh, I was really glad I wasn't working in school at that time, uh, knowing how spring and end of school year had always been so important in that setting. Um, Rick may be able to speak to that, but uh, we were able to pump the brakes on communication for our constituents. In hindsight, I think that was a mistake. And where we weren't really able to take a delay was in our programming planning. And fortunately, even though we like, Joyce mentioned, you know, is this a two month delay? Is this a three month delay? Can we hold our breath this long and then really sprint into the season? But with things like a migratory shad and a lamprey migration season and river herring season, they come when the com they come and you gotta be there. And to plant trees, you gotta do it in the spring and the fall. So there was stuff on that side where thankfully people started to adapt right away and we probably learned communications wise and sustainability wise from the, the program side of our organization they really started uh i don't think they were able to pump the brakes for more than two weeks just because it was it was coming at us uh at my the program colleagues and seeing how they began to plan and plan with contingencies gave those of us in external affairs and communications and fundraising uh, a good model. So going, coming out of March, we started uh, struggling with, you know, how do you do things like virtual meetings? I, I don't remember exactly when that happened, but it was a complete struggle for us having never done anything like that before. Um, thankfully figured it out. You know, I, it was, being resigned to low turnout, I think, because we were throwing parties and nobody was showing up. Uh, but then, you know, we learned if you're gonna throw a Zoom party, you've got to put some effort into getting people in the room. Um, and that was another way we started to communicate with people. As much as I've heard for the better part of a year about Zoom fatigue, I've been more amazed by the Zoom stamina. And in fact, the interest People came to those sessions as an opportunity initially, sort of in year one, for community, wherever we could find it. And then um, just adapting. People have continued to be present in a way, uh, I don't know, it's, it's we've all learned is my impression. So communication on the fundraising side, we delayed, but with an end of fiscal year of June, the necessity forced us to do some of that uh, planning with contingency. And I would say we went into it with more trepidation um, given what was happening in the world and you know, knowing some of our families would be dealing with people in much uh, in bad situations, health and otherwise. So it was, 
we were very self-conscious about asking, but uh, I was impressed by how people responded to the need. And I, I felt like it was different than 2008, 2009, and 10, when there was a dramatic shift in my experience to basic needs. What I think I observed this time was more of a, a shift to a few priorities. And organizations tried to stay there for organizations they cared about or believed in, like, like all of ours. And that, that was my experience with uh, CRC. So I think by the time we got through that end of fiscal year, June 2020, and going forward, we had more confidence to communicate. Um, we re I think our takeaway was people weren't going to be offended to be talking about these issues and these needs of that were very, very real. And a conservation season is the summer. If you're not in the summer, you're going to miss it. So I don't know. I think my takeaways for survival and adapting was to plan with contingencies to know the people who love you are going to or care about you and your mission are going to care about you and your mission, uh, even when there's national or global crises. Um, and thankfully, having colleagues who were willing not to sit on their hands and wait for it to get better, but to sort of to really try to figure out how to work with the cards we were dealt. Um, and people learn to adapt both in terms of having to pick up the slack when you couldn't have volunteers together, even outdoors. That was, that was hard. Um, and then, you know, I imagine we all struggle with, okay, if they're outdoors, aren't they okay? If they're outdoors and they're six feet apart, but what if they're outdoors and they got to drive somewhere together? Um, and all those considerations. So I know that's adapt, plan with contingencies and keep communicating and communicate your needs and people come through. That was my resiliency lesson. Wow, that, that's, that's very heartwarming. Um, and I think we're all gonna say pretty much the same thing. People came through. Um, wow. so Susan, you wanna uh, take it away? So um, I'm going to echo a lot of the same things and I won't repeat them, but I'll try to say what's a little different that we had to do with the, the Landmark Trust and Scott Farm. The Landmark Before, Trust... Uh, Susan, can you just explain a little bit about Landmark? That's what I was about to do, yes. So the Landmark Trust USA is an historic preservation nonprofit that was started by a British group called the Landmark Trust, and with, they came over with Nalaka, Rudyard Kipling's home. And eventually we split, but we still are under the same model. And they're kind of like our elder sibling. Um, but really the whole concept is not every important historic house can be a historic house museum or a theater, you know. So especially with ha homes, um, how do you maintain them so that they're there in the future for use. And, and particularly, as, as I said, knowing about uh, Nalaka and Roger Kipling's home and the carriage house, which was Roger Kipling's carriage house. And we have other properties as well. And um, we're really the Landmark Trust USA, even though we're headquartered in, in Demerson, Vermont, we have the ability to be national and we are expanding recently into other parts of New England and Mid-Atlantic. But the, the concept is people stay in our properties and we look to 60% occupancy so that we can afford the maintenance. Unlike you know, um, a group that goes ahead and they, they fundraise and they get the grants to fix up the property, we are able to continue to, once we get the property fixed up, to continue through our nonprofit, keep on maintaining. So we're not a, we, we it is, short-term rentals, but it's really with a purpose. And we also have an education mission. Um, we invite people into our houses and we explain about historic preservation, historic trades. And then we were also given a farm, which is a Scott farm, which is a 571 acre orchard that is a separate business, but it's a B corporation, which is a social responsible business. So I'm gonna talk more about the Landmark Trust 
just because that is the nonprofit arm, but I can touch on because we all relate together. We considered the Scott Farm one of our properties, just like our other five properties. So when COVID hit, um, it, it, as I said at the beginning, we depend on people staying in our properties to help pay for the overall maintenance. I'm sure John has the same model with the latches. So what to do, you know, we don't, we have in our, in our um, terms and conditions that, you know, you make a reservation and you cancel and you don't get money back. But of course we're gonna give money back during COVID. We try, you know, what we asked people if they would consider we are a nonprofit, if they would just um, take a credit for a future stay. And I'd say 95% of the credits or maybe 90, somewhere around there, were credits for future stays. But then we had to close down and we closed down through June, just like, you know, any other hospitality fields. And, um, it was scary. It was like, well, you know, we never, we never knew when we were going to be opening up for us. We were just going to open up to Vermont. Then we were going to open up to New England and then this. And so we had to constantly change. And so the, the word that I used was, you know, flexibility and pivoting constantly. We, you know, um, pay, while we were closed, we, it's a wonderful opportunity for historic property to do all the work on their properties, but you don't want to use all your your capital, because you don't know the way the future is happening. So we we did. We concentrated. We used paycheck protection funds. Really came in handy. I kept all my staff on, and we just worked on cleaning and organizing, so that when people came back, they were in um, in really good place. So, but we had to constantly be reading. You know, who can we let to into our properties? How can they come in? We had, you know, it, it was it was a lot of work for our little nonprofit to deal with constant changing. The one good thing is that we were really, really fortunate, maybe just by the luck that our, our new website was just um, completed at the beginning of March. So having a, a new website that was easy to use was a godsend to us. And so that helped with communication. We did an awful lot of communication. The other thing we, we, you know, you talk about galas and stuff, we depend on one of our largest events is the Nalaka Estate and Rhododendron Tour that happens every June. And it wasn't clear, could we have gatherings? Couldn't you have gatherings? And so finally we just said, no, people are not gonna feel comfortable. So we got a grant from uh, Brattleboro Savings and Loan and it's still on our website and it's a wonderful video, but we felt like it was a kind of a postcard out from the Landmark Trust to the community um, of our uh, giving a tour of Nalaka as well as seeing the rhododendrons in bloom. And it was really appreciated and it's still looked at. So that was a wonderful thing. We talked about doing some other educational events, but there were so many on there and what people really get at is coming to our properties. Um, and, you know, we just kept on being flexible about our marketing and we also felt that this was not the time for us to go out and fundraise because there were so many more dire needs in our community. We wanted to hold back other than the federal and state dollars, but hold back, but could be doing a call for action because our social services and all the important needs. So it was scary. Will we ever be able to fundraise again? You know, And when we finally were doing our next annual appeal, we did fine, but we also backed away. But communications, I'm gonna uh, um, agree with what's been said before. Um, we also made sure we checked in with our really large donors, just because you know they are kind of our lifeblood and our guests and our regular guests and just checking in and making sure that, that we are here. And, um, but once we were able to accept guests again, being um, a whole house rental, uh, our properties are generally doing really well. Nalaka was empty during 2020. I, you know, that gigantic, beautiful house was empty. Um, and now you can't get a reservation in there. So people have come back and I think they value getting together with their families. And our same thing with our um, a state and rhododendron tour once we decided to go forward with it last year with COVID precautions, 
you know, there's a lot, there was a lot of new ways how we cleaned our houses and new ways how we did events. Um, it sold out. So I think people were dying to get together and um, be in community again. Um, just briefly, and then I'll let other people speak. Um, Scott Farm, you know, our season, we were a farm, we're a farm. So it wasn't that we really got in, they had to get ready for the next season. But what we did notice a couple of things, well, we couldn't do weddings, which did impact um, our properties because we have weddings at the farm. Um, but we um, did notice that the tree, our tree sale was unbelievably fantastic because people were wanting to have tr things to grow. We sold out in minutes, you know, of our tree sale. And the same thing when we went to um, do our annual um, CSA for apples, it was the largest number. So once we were able to at Scott Farm to start doing community events, they were really successful because we also said, look, you know, our farm is here for you to walk around and enjoy. And a lot of people really came over there and 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 was able to use, you know, use our property and look at the beautiful historic buildings that we have. So I think that's probably enough for now. Oh, social yes. media. Don't forget social media. Oh, go ahead. That's it. Oh, okay. I, I know. I you, wanna, what? Did you want to ask me a question, Joyce? I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to tell everybody who's listening in right now that uh, you can ask questions yourself if you put them in the chat. That's all I had to say. Did you have something more to say, Susan? Okay, then we'll move to Rick. You want to tell us about Okay, I think they're unmuted. Um, I'm beaming in from Rockingham and um, talking about Main Street Arts, uh, a small, it began as a, in a church basement 33 years ago as a uh, community uh, arts association with the mission of nurturing artistic creativity and appreciation and building community. Um, we offered visual and performing arts classes, theater performances, gallery exhibits, summer arts camps, and we also function as kind of a community center where different groups meet in Saxons River, population 450. Um, so if you think you have demographic challenges in Brattleboro, dot, dot, dot. Um, so um, by 2015, we had a paid executive director and a $1.2 million refurbished building. Uh, we were growing, life was good. Now, cut to March 19th, 2019. Uh, I had just wrapped up my second uh, three-year term on the MSA board. I was in the dress rehearsal for MSA's remarkable uh, presentation or production of uh, Cabaret. And um, I was reviewing it for, I was a reviewer for the reformer at that point, and I was sitting down with my notes ready to go. It was an amazing, amazing performance. The next morning, a couple of cast members reported they had fevers. Um, folks, other people weren't feeling well. We had various emergency meetings. And after investing thousands of hours and many thousands of dollars in cabaret, it, it closed before it opened. Uh, obviously a body blow uh, to our finances and our morale. Um, so I was not on the board at that point, but I cared deeply about the organization, did my best to support it. Um, and as John mentioned, um, when you're a performing arts organization and your audience disappears, um, you have a problem. And we, we've struggled mightily, and I'm gonna be fairly candid about, about what we did and what worked and what, what might not have. Um, so we applied for PPP dollars, and um, when, those, when that money ran out, uh, the organization had to cut expenses mercilessly to survive. And that meant laying off our two employees, our executive director uh, and our artistic director. Uh, David Stern, our, the artistic director, is a well-known uh, person, personage, I should say. And he is, had led the organization to, to become focused on major musicals. I don't know if anyone in the audience has attended. We had Sweeney Todd, Jesus Christ Superstar, um, 
uh, lots of big shows at the Bells Falls Opera House. So um, the departure of our artistic director uh, was forced us to change our mission. The, the, the big time musical uh, was not going to happen. And so we, uh, that, was, that, was a, that was just a moment of, of, of reckoning for us. The, um, uh, the David's deprived of his Main Street Arts job, David Stern um, justifiably began his own uh, theater organization uh, known as the Wild Goose Players. And um, uh, it's been very successful and now dominates that large musical market, if you will. Um, there, uh, however, um, previous Main Street Art board members and a lot of volunteers went with David. Theater was, big theater was their world and they followed David to his new organization. Um, so the lack of any operational staff and the lack of income put tremendous pressure on the board. And a period of dissension, misunderstandings, chaos happened and all but two board members resigned. So, um, and it was, it was at that point that um, uh, I was invited to rejoin the new board, which was just a, a, a great opportunity for, for, for me. And now under the fabulous leadership of Susan Still, who is in our audience, I see her image down below, um, we are returning to our roots as a community arts organization. Our strategy for survival has been, as I mentioned, cutting costs, establishing best practices for management, building a new board that listened to, respected, understood that we had to run the place and we had to get along to run the place. Um, and and um, artistic organizations are known for large egos and, I'm, and we have our share, maybe I'm one of them, I don't know. Anyway, we had to, um, we had to really rework the way we worked together. And that was perhaps the biggest challenge that we've overcome. So we're now, we're now doing workshops in class and visual arts, acting and wellness. We have a gallery exhibits. We have artist talks, workshops. We got a performing arts series with music and theater um, and the theater rental program that John, I'm amazed you, you had 600 rentals. That is mind blowing. We are just beginning to, to tread that path and we might um, seek some of your advice if you don't mind sharing what you've learned. Uh, we have a sound check service for emerging musicians to come in and work with a, a professional sound technician. And we're um, uh, working with the main, main street, the fourth, the, the Saxon River 4th of July parade. I don't know how many of you have attended it, but it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing community event. And we're gonna play a key role um, this time. So although we're excited to be offering so much programming, the ticket revenue does not come close, not close to uh, providing the monthly nut, what it keeps us to, go keep, to keep alive, to covering overhead. Philanthropy, philanthropy remains our primary source of income and we are rebuilding our relationships with our donors. And Kathleen Breyer, uh, who works at the uh, Dartmouth Medical School as a uh, fundraiser, is our the chair of our development um, organization or committee, and she's done a fantastic job. We raised about seventeen thousand dollars in our last mutual, I mean, our annual fund um, uh, mailing, and that's for us really a remarkable amount. So the story's not over. We're still um, working hard, and um, I would welcome. Uh, questions or ideas from the audience or from my fellow uh, presenters. Thank you. That was really interesting. Okay, and last, certainly not least, Lindsay, do you want to talk? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay. Um, I am the Managing Director of Community and Impact at Retreat Farm. Uh, during COVID, we, at the beginning of COVID, uh, we had a lot of believers that COVID would last a long time. Um, so we really didn't skip a beat in terms of springing into action. Um, I think we were two weeks in and we already had a plan. Um, we, you know, we launched our community food project, which was just really a out of necessity for the community. So we launched the community food project 
Um, but in addition to that, we also immediately turned our efforts to identifying how we could transform the property um, into a public park and commons for the community. So we already knew that visitors were, you know, enjoyed the property um, and loved to be here. And we wanted to say, we, you know, we spend time thinking, how can we enhance that? What else can we do to be able to um, allow people to enjoy the property more? How can we put all of our animals out on pasture so they're accessible to everyone, even if the barn is not accessible? Um, so we immediately put all of our animals out on pasture for everyone. We developed a new labyrinth garden with the, you know, heart, sweat, blood, and tears of our staff, um, you know, hand mounding uh, these concentric circles into, into a labyrinth. Um, had Bob Bowman craft a fiddlehead out of the side of the hill as a natural amphitheater um, and undertook a, a project of re-signing the entire trail network. So we, we were quick to action. Um, and we kept communicating with our, our donor base and, and really saw an opportunity to actually grow our community, not necessarily our donor base, but our community. Um, for us, um, you know, it's, it's our communication has always come from a very authentic, grounded place of really wanting to engage people in a meaningful way and develop relationships with them. And we weren't as focused on you know, donations or fee for service, um, you know, during the COVID period, we were really just wanting to let people know that we were there for them, the property was there for them, and that we wanted them to be a part of our community. So we did a wonderful job of growing our community um, over the past two years, um, you know, more than doubling our email list, um, and our household mailing list growing, I think, by three, three or four times. Um, you know, communicating to people that they belonged at the farm um, was our primary communication tactic, that they belonged, that membership was free, that we valued, you know, a $5 donation just as much as we valued a $5,000 donation um, to really uh, promote our ideals and our values of uh, inclusivity and welcome, you know, being welcome to everyone. Um, and so we've, we had a lot of success um, in doing that. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we were able to, you know, continue uh, programming last year. Um, and, you know, our event season sort of got jump started um, when some of the regulations relaxed. Um, and, you know, that was a roller coaster ride in, in of itself. You know, uh, many of us were not expecting to do as much programming as we did last year. We had to be flexible and, and we, you know, sort of had to hit the gas pedal last summer um, when everyone was demanding that things happen again. Um, and because we are an outdoor venue, we we really didn't have an excuse not to do it, even though they, you know there was some trepidation too of of restarting that programming. Um, but we during COVID, we actually took a very different approach. We did not do Zoom programs. We did not move things online. Um, we didn't do any of that um, because we are a place based organization, and we had the opportunity to encourage people to come to our place to, you know, to the farm. And so we emphasized that rather than trying to invest our resources in, you know, creating virtual barn tours or meet and greets with the animals, which I know many farms did, um, you know, Zoom birthday wishes from animals. We didn't do any of that because we really just wanted to focus on people connecting to the land because that was what was important to, um, to us. Um, so the communication side of growing our, um, growing our audience worked very well, um, though we probably should have asked for more. Uh, we should have asked for more money along the way. Um, we gave a lot of things away for free because we felt that it was the right thing to do. Um, and I don't think that we would make a different choice, um, but I think that um, communicating our needs and communicating um, 
our financials uh, is not something that we have historically done as an organization during COVID or prior. And, um, you know, we are highly dependent on philanthropy. Uh, we don't have an endowment, which is a common misconception um, of the farm. And, um, and people, you know, didn't know, you know, they value what they experience at the farm, but they don't necessarily know how much it costs to run, you know, to run the farm similar to, to you, John, or to you, Rick, you know, especially a historic property, <laughs> um, at least, you know, two others uh, with the Landmark Trust and the Latches historic properties are expensive and, um, <laughs> And they are, you know, challenging to maintain. And then for us, you have, you layer on all of the land that we have on top of that, that we steward. And it is a very expensive, um, expensive proposition. But I think that we had the opportunity during COVID to really understand where we could create value for the community. And so we're in the very fortunate position right now of being able to have created a lot of value across many different programs and platforms and now we are, you know, embarking as an organization on really identifying uh, where we can add the most community value and what, how we can uniquely contribute to the community um, and how we can continue doing the programming and creating the value for the community in partnership with the rest of the incredible other nonprofits in the area um, and or individual entrepreneurs. Um, so that will be, uh, you know, a very interesting process as it unfolds. Oh, thank you. That's really interesting. I saw people lining up for free food all summer long. It was exciting. I uh, congratulate you guys for, for doing that. We have a question. We want more questions, but we have <laughs> one. Um, which practices such as remote meetings, programs, or website content virtual tours, videos that you depended on during the pandemic, do you plan to continue when in-person programs are safe? Um, anyone want to answer that? While you're thinking about that, I can say for the friends that we just had a board meeting this afternoon and our annual meeting is coming up next month and we've decided we're too lazy to meet in person. It's just so convenient to, you know, stay in your pajamas and slippers and put on a good top and have a Zoom meeting. So I, I'm afraid we'll never meet in public again. <laughs> so anyone want to answer that question? Joyce, I'll, I'll add one thing. Go ahead. Uh, like so many other people here, you know, the Latches is a place-based organization. So um, we, we're, we didn't successfully migrate much programming to the virtual world. But I will say something about Zoom, uh, kind of picking up on what you just mentioned, Joyce. Uh, we were able to put add a board member uh, who doesn't live in Brattleboro anymore. Um, and and uh, this person is a wonderful contributor to our board and a former resident. So, um, you know, moving to Zoom has enriched, um, enriched our board. Uh, and um, it's going to be an interesting moment when we return to in-person in person or, or try to stay hybrid. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's an example of Zoom being a real asset for us. Um, we were able to add this person. And I will say that I know that um, I know a church choir director who was able to uh, keep some of the people who had moved away from the community uh, still participating in the church choir via Zoom. So uh, I think, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of Zoom Zoom thoughts, but I'm, I'm pro Zoom and it's opened some doors for us. I agree. I wish I had bought stock in the company in March of 2020. Uh, Susan, did you have something to say? I was just going to add on to the Zoom. The other thing that I noticed and it kept us, my staff extremely busy is now that because some of our board members, we have some local board members since our headquarters are here, but we also have throughout New England, and because now we didn't depend on meeting in per person and people got more comfortable with Zoom, we had so many committee meetings. It was, you know, but they were really great because I have a working board. So, but it was, it was like 
come on guys, enough, enough, stop, stop. <laughs> there was too much, <laughs> but it was really, it showed how much more active your boards can be if they don't have to sometimes get in the car. Now that's important to meet in per person. And we, we we're going to have a retreat in February that we canceled. And I think that's the flip side is that we have people that came on our board during COVID that have never met in per person yet, so. Yeah, that's very interesting. When the, <clears throat> the last summer, when it looked like we were free and we could go out, we staged one event after another. We didn't even care if we made money. It was just so wonderful to be around people. And then by September, we were back in the box, <laughs> these little boxes that we're in right now. We have another question. Oh, did somebody else want to say something about uh, that first question? We have another one. It looks like two or three of these organizations are a hybrid of nonprofit and for-profit. Do you think that was an advantage or a disadvantage during COVID? Um, we, I mean, our nonprofit makes money to go into it. And so, yes, that was a disadvantage, I guess, because we weren't making any money and our, our profit, our business that was profit is a profit business is a farm. <laughs> so farms just, you're lucky if a farm can meet its bills and continue, you know, to do well. So I, I don't, you know, I don't really know other than, you know, I was, I was drawn to my job because I love the fact that it's a working nonprofit that figures out a way to get money back into its, its to do its work. Um, but you know, then you don't have as much of a, we don't depend on as much of, um, I mean, we do have an annual appeal, but most of our work is done through people staying in our properties. So, so I guess John, that was not helpful. <laughs> John, do you want to say something? You've got a big nonprofit, for-profit split there. I, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm used to how our strange, uh, um, combination of things and I think um, it's an advantage all the time and so I think it was an advantage uh, during COVID um, although for a while it was two organizations having a devastating time but um, I think um, you know echoing what um, what Susan said you know our for-profit corporation is the is the entity that handles the hotel and last summer our hotel came roaring back to life uh, and again what Lindsay was saying faster than we we were ready for um for people they were there saying we're ready to come out so um you know the for-profit side of our things has um over the last year or so um been been okay uh and uh back to life so i i'm, I'm just used to it and i and and i think it's an advantage all the time and our nonprofit doesn't have to worry about running a hotel they can focus on the things that um, that they're really there for, which is taking care of the building and making cool stuff happen in the theater and tending to the relationship of the community in the theater. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've separated church and state um, pretty well. And um, I will say one of the things that we did during COVID was begin doing joint entity strategic planning, which we'd never done before. Um, and uh, so that's another really strong um, outcome of this is we got everyone in the room together um, uh, via Zoom, um, working on, on uh, shared, shared interests. So that was another way behind the scenes that we were able to um, strengthen ourselves, so. Okay, well, we're waiting for another question. I have one. Um, my, my nonprofit is all volunteer and so we didn't have anyone to let go, but did you have to let go of staff? Any of you? How painful was that? I know, Sue, you said you didn't. Rick? It was, ter it was terribly painful and, and we're still recovering from that, but there was no option for us. It looks like Brett has a, a question or a comment. Yeah, Brett? Yes, I, I, thank you. Uh, I'll share an observation from uh, our organization and then what may be, um, a useful suggestion and that's we're a watershed wide organization so we're four states uh that has been really problematic in trying to figure out what somebody's version or identification with 
the river? Is it the river a trib? Is it the vacation house they go to in Vermont, though they live on the river in Connecticut? It's all those different things. And as we tried to go out and be amongst that community, it was always really hard to figure out where to go and then how to position what mattered when we got there. So going back to that question, I think from Susan about Zoom, it's been an amazing solution for us in terms of being able to do a theme or purpose um, session that anyone can come to from Long Island Sound, New York City, Boston, Maine, uh, or Brattleboro. So what I thought was a tremendous struggle for us trying to figure out how to be, um, to resonate for audiences by geography or issue and struggling to sort of fill the room to a satisfactory level, Zoom has been amazing. And I think, I don't know if it was you, Joyce, or, or Susan said, you know, what are you going to continue? That, that is a, a huge win uh, of sort of an aha moment for us as an organization and a new tool that can really change that community. And I guess that I've heard, and I, I, I think I can relate to the idea that all of you have place-based organizations. I would just ask if you really went down the path of, are you also a cause? Because a cause can be also a bigger community and you don't necessarily need to get people on the grounds to, for it to resonate. And I personally think of all the things you do as causes I would care about and do care about. So there may be ways, virtual tools, um, can be useful as a way to enrich your community's connections to, to your, what are facilities and, and I think at least three of the four cases, well, Brooks, I guess I would put in four of the five cases, you know, buildings with serious maintenance and upkeep challenges. So relying on a 450 person community or even a 12,000 person greater Brattleboro is still a very limited audience if you just look at who can be there for uh, an evening event. So that would be, I think I'm hearing you all at causes and a much wider audience than what we have as an immediate demographic. Um, I think that's very true for us. Uh, the first Wednesday's lectures that my group pays for and that we put on at the library, um, when we were in person, there were audiences of about 100 people and they all liked to schmooze beforehand and gossip afterward. When we started doing it on Zoom, we had people from all over the country. Hmm. Our, as you say, our audience was, was vastly improved. I don't know if we want to let that go or if, I don't know what's going to happen. What do you see happening for the future? Oh, um, Rick? Uh, I had a question about how you monetize that um, that audience. Um, that's that you know we have to those of us who are in performing arts. I think most of the the rest of you have to generate income. I, Susan, you have guests staying in your your buildings and so on. But those of us who need ticket revenue, how do you monetize the um, the, the 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 social the uh, Zoom attendance? Um, I can I can relate to that because I'm also sit on the board of the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center who did an amazing job with their programming online. I think they, they made it really clear what they were doing. They weren't asking a fee to, to attend it because that's I think a hard thing to do um, though, mm -hmm. but they made it really clear and they had people from all over the world attending their Zooms. Mm -hmm. They also, when you signed up, they got your information. So that expanded their donation reach right. too. And so they, they, I think, you know, I've seen quite a few organizations such as um, Next Stage who really became very relevant in, in how they were reaching out to the community. So it may not be that the online thing brings you in the money. I mean, there, may, there might be ways, but it's also your reach and being, becoming more relevant um, to people. So that's, that's what I noticed being on the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center 
and just being a community member in Putney with Next Stage with their band, you know, their band wagon series. So yes, great example. Thank you. I don't know if it's helpful, but um, the traveling musician community, the uh, folk singers and the, all the people who um, make their living on the road, they pretty much did uh, weekly concerts with uh, Venmo and um, PayPal numbers to, to donate. And that's how they supported themselves for two years when they couldn't go out and make music in front of a crowd. Joyce? Yeah? I'd also like to hold up um, as another example, um, the literary festival, which started doing these literary cocktail hours. Uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't know if their plans are long-term, but as an example, you know, before COVID, they were a one weekend a year, um, they sprang to life for one weekend a year, uh, really great event. But, um, you know, these Zoom things give them a chance to be in front of their community all year round. Uh, and I, I can't help but, but hope that that really helps them stay present with people and, and, and drive some, some greater success for them. And they're not the only ones, but I think that it is a good way for a, uh, something to um, just expand its, its presence in front of people. That's true. Rick, there's a comment for you. Opening night ticket, at normal premium, but anyone can watch on demand after the fact. That will expand the mailing list and the organization's relevance and reach out just as Susan explained. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, um, audience questions? No, I have some. Did you, um, any of you uh, reach out for outside expertise? when you were dealing with a pandemic? Susan, please. Uh, the state of Vermont had a really, I really love what they did. They had this program that you could apply to and get technical assistance. So they were keeping, oh, it was your cat that was meowing. Um, they, they, you could, they were paying the consultants who, you know, small businesses were struggling. So we got help from on the fly media um, to help us figure out how to do better social media, how to, um, what other things we can do. Cause at that point we didn't know that we were, that people were gonna come running back to our properties. We were scared. And um, so they gave us a lot of advice. And one of the things they did is they helped us to put together um, baskets that people could purchase and so that they know that they could have the essentials when they got to our property. Um, and that just gave us a little extra money up front. Um, the other people, uh, the other thing we did is back to, I think it was John was saying they did a strategic plan. We did a strategic, we finished up our strategic plan using technical assistance from the state. So um, working with watershed consulting so those things we took, we took advantage when, of stuff that we felt was relevant and um, was careful not to go down too many rabbit holes. But I also found um, there were some really great um, organizations out there that were giving really good webinars that were helping such as Vermont Business for Social Responsibility. I took advantage of, you know, there was too, might find have been too much, but the ones that I, I finally took advantage of were really good really good. Um, Brett? Question to the group and maybe anyone else. I, I haven't heard, um, other than John's theater rentals, a uh, new revenue line introduced. And, um, you know, maybe not a good one, but one that I, comes to mind for me is merchandising. You know, whether it's Kipling, lore or merchandise or arts or the retreat farm doing sort of the life is good motif of of the farm um that comes to mind for me with your sort of wide national ideas you know, could um i haven't heard anyone mention it and it's just making me wonder are there other revenue lines that you you came up with sort of pushed by necessity you know maybe a 
a mail order CSA for apples, you know, a special bag from Vermont that you never would have done before, but given the circumstances, it made sense. I don't know. Did anyone? We we do. We have our um, essentials and a lot of it is B Corporation local biz- businesses that people can purchase as part of purchasing a stay. We are in the process of, we are in the process, we have watercolor images of two of our buildings and we're in the process of getting mugs done. Mm-hmm. And um, which is always a goal of ours. We're also lo- looking to watch, uh, work with uh, Laura Zendel on um, some rhododendron mugs. So um, we are in the process, but you know, those type of things don't, we, right. we do it, oh, had always envisioned of having a very tasteful online store but it's not going to make. It's not going to um, keep the know, lights on. <laughs> keep the lights on, but it's it, it's it's helpful, you know. Um, I think from selling products, we've we've done okay, and we make sure we're sell, selling apple pies from Scott Farm. So we're helping Scott Farm. Where you know, we're one of the things I think um, going into it was. Scott Farm is one of our businesses, but it was very separate. But now we're more back to the strategic plan. We're under the same um, working together. How can we benefit each other and help each other out? And I think that's what John was talking about between um, his businesses. We have another question. Did you expand your use of social media? And if so, in what way? And was it worth it? Anyone? I would say we focused on growing our audience using not necessarily social media, but using primarily our email uh, list and encouraging people to become part of our email list. Um, But we did that as a very strategic thing to actually um, walk away from social media as an organization. Um, So we sort of took our, you know, we invested heavily in growing our membership and our email audience over time, you know, over the pandemic. And then last fall, actually, as a result of that growth, felt that we were then at the step to that we could no longer rely on Facebook and Instagram and chose to discontinue our use of those platforms for, an, you know, uh, ideological um, and values based decision on that. And, and we haven't missed it yet <laughs> so um, <laughs> um and it didn't impact our didn't impact our fundraising um you know and can i just ask what, why why yeah um so yeah, the farm I, yeah so the farm made us you know the thing is is social media is great for you know some things but it is it is an it is inherently has its flaws and can also be used for for you know for horrible things also and is focused on you know the entire premise of Facebook and social media is to serve up more ads and keep people online and we are a place-based organization we value face-to-face connection we value human interaction we value relationship building in person and that is in conflict with uh, with the design of of Facebook, and you know, further layered on that, uh, our you know, Facebook in the U.S. is actually largely uh, tame um, in comparison to developing countries, um, where you know they are just controlling the narrative, and they are facilitating some very heinous uh things that you know you know actually facebook in the u.s is is you know is so mild in comparison to to developing countries so it was a values-based decision i mean of course it's so much easier it's so much easier to post a facebook event um to to get your get the word out about things of course it's it's the easiest thing to do um, but we actually invested in more traditional media, like a quarterly print newsletter, you know, our almanac, uh, you know, we're actually going more back to, to print because it's 
it's actually for us, it's driving more authentic relationships, more content based things that, uh, you know, social media just isn't it isn't as uh, powerful um, at doing that in some respects. Um, there are very, very, of course, there are many arguments to that and many sides of that coin. Um, and as a marketer and a strategist, I see the value in 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 so many things. But um, it was a decision that we made as an organization. So I'm almost sorry I asked that question, but. <laughs> I, um, I want to read something. Someone left us a message. Honor, gratitude, and respect to all of you for not only keeping your organizations and causes alive during these challenging times, but for giving to the community. And now I have another message on top of that, so I can't read it. Oh, while you yourself struggled. Thank you for all your sharing and hard work, for sharing your hard won wisdom. Good night. Well, that's very nice. I mean, I don't think of it that way myself. I really feel that for, for me, I was just waiting for it to be over so we could go back to being normal. And now I realize that there's no, there's not going to be normal, at least not the way I remembered it. It's going to be new normal, whatever that means. And so what do you think for you? Each of you, the new normal is going to be. How are you going to change if we ever are open again and maskless again? John, you want to start? I think um, the new normal for us is, is going to be a, um, um, a much different um, looking theater operation. I think for a lot of reasons. Um, um, commercial first run movies will still be important to us, but we're going to have a much more diversified um, portfolio of activities in the theater. The theater rental program um, taught us the value of people being able to customize uh, and personalize their experience in the latches. We could still be the latches and be a special place, but people were also um, creating their own experiences there. And I think that's going to be um, um, a pretty important part of what we do going forward. And I think um, more and big live events as well and, and kind of moving into uh, a more diverse use. I, I, think, I think really it, I think it was inevitable that we would head there. And I think COVID just uh, picked up the needle and put it down in a different place on the record uh, for us. And um, if we're smart, we better listen to to where the needle is now and, and go forward from there. So I think that's a very clear uh, takeaway from this. And um, it's really incumbent on us and on me to um, guide us into the future, which is already here. Very, very well said. Susan, do you wanna uh, say something? Um, I would just say, I, I think what, what it's taught us here is the ability to be flexible to just because there's a certain way of doing things, it might not always be the right way and to just be creative. Um, it also, when we're able to do stuff with the community and we feel that it's safe, it, we jump at it now because it, it could close down tomorrow. So we opened up our farm to our crepe nights and that was such a beautiful thing to have. Um, and the, you know, so the importance of community, we're getting ready to open up. We're having two events with a month apart, which is crazy, but we just know the weather's going to be nice. This is the time to do it, jump at it. So we'll have something at the Dutton farmhouse in May and, and then our annual event at Nalaka. So just be flexible and meet with people when you can. All right. Rick. Well, I've got to echo uh, John's comments that expanding our programming portfolio is crucial. And that's a little bit of making lemonade out of the lemon of our losing the, the big musical thing, but it may be a, a blessing in disguise for us. So we're, we're expanding our, our, our portfolio and we're also returning to our roots as a community arts organization. And um, so those are, those are our two uh, foci and we hope to do strategic planning this summer. Um, we happen to have Susan Still 
a, a professional a strategic planning person as our board chair now. So we're, uh, we're, we're well equipped for that, for that next step. Okay, Brad. Sorry, Joyce, what, what, what was the question again? Um, going forward, is there a new normal that you're going to be following or are you going to try to go back to the, uh, the way it was before the pandemic? Thank you. Uh, I would say we're, we're in a lessons learned and uh, the, demand, the demands to be more creative during the crisis has taught us some things we very much will keep doing, whether that's you know continuing Zoom to reach people across a four state region and beyond, proved, proven really a gift of a lesson from COVID really for, for the river going forward to have a more engaged community and certainly for the organization. Um, I think the, the flexibility, planners, hate flexibility. I, I always have gone at it with, you know, plan 25% and it's going to change when you get to that point and just keep moving towards whatever. But the planners in my life don't go that way. But I think COVID in a sense has taught us that that can work. It can work well. And in situations with a shifting landscape and shifting guidelines, whether it's local or state, it, you want to know how to do it and be comfortable with it because that just might be the reality we have to work in. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot we're gonna keep keep going forward. Um, I don't want to be conservative, but the uh, what what we learned, I think, is that we were doing a lot of things right because yeah. we were collecting books as we always do for our book sale, which was going to be attached to the strolling of the heifers in June of 2020. And <laughs> poof, no book sale, no strolling of the heifers, no nothing. And when we finally this summer were able to put together a book sale, the pent up demand for those books the people who came back every single day to buy more when we were selling them $5 a bag at the end, people were lining up to fill bags that, that we were a good organization. We had started out as a good organization. We'd come through the pandemic and we're gonna continue being a good organization because I'm supporting the library and the librarians. And I think that was, uh, that was heartwarming for me to, to learn. Okay, we have one more question and then we're gonna close down. John, Susan, anyone else having done strategic planning during the crisis and unusual circumstances, do you anticipate the plans will remain relevant as good guides for your mission focus programs and prior? It doesn't all re and, and prioritization going forward. I don't even understand that question. Does anyone? Should I read it again? Well, I asked it. I could give it a try. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, I'm just, I, I'm used to you sort of, part of a strategic plan is re pulling stakeholders together in the moment of where you are at a point in time and your best understanding of where you're going forward. And I just have felt like our moment well, we've just been talking about new normals. I would have been eager to plan. It sounds like the retreat wins the prize on the two week uh, pivot and plan timeline. Remarkable, that's, that's a new record, I think, uh, for organizational planning, but how, how that would work and have shelf life for you given how, I, I think relatively remarkable the circumstances were going into and what was forced on us. So I'm just, have you, are you satisfied with those plans and expecting them to be a three to five year plan or were they a, a survival plan when push came to shove? I mean, I'll respond. Um, we had done stakeholder stuff before COVID came and we had made a decision, but it, nothing, it was even before I was on staff, 
but nothing had been done with it. And we had a full board then. So ours was a chance to look internally of where we were going as an organization. We had done a lot of planning around COVID and that was more a function of staff checking in with our senior board members. Um, so I think we, it was stuff that we needed to look at as an organization. So I think it has a shelf life, but we made it a three-year plan so that when we got, but so it allowed us to kind of, a lot of new staff on, that were at both organizations, Landmark and Scott Farm, and it allowed us just to kind of take stock and where we're going, COVID aside. And, but there was some COVID related stuff in there. Well, I think it helped us. And right. I think, oh, I'm sorry. You know. uh, it, for us, the issues that um, sort of have been laid bare by COVID are issues that we were facing anyway. I think it was a real dose of truth serum. And uh, at the same time, it also gave us a little bit of an of a occasion of pause in sort of normal operations. So in some ways, it's, I think, a really ideal uh, time. I'm, you know, it was a pretty fearless process for us because we'd just gotten used to, um, you know, seeing, seeing things bones and all because of COVID. So we were really embracing the task, but we were also in a moment um, where we could, um, we, we could take the time and justify the time to look at ourselves in a, in a different way. So in some ways, I really think it was an ideal time, although I do not wish for another pandemic. Uh, if you um, haven't started your planning yet, uh, don't wait for the next one. But uh, it, really wor it really worked out in a way. Okay, is there anything that um, anyone wants to add to this? Or... Um... Lindsay, did you have something you wanted to say? I think I skipped over you the last time. No, I, that's okay. I'm good. <laughs> okay, then um, anyone else? Then I think we've uh, done pretty well. Um, I have an announcement to read. On behalf of Vermont Independent Media and the Commons, Thank you to all of our participants and those who joined the conversation. Yes, definitely. The next mentor me media mentoring project event is scheduled for May 18th. It'll be on opinion writing. And Vim and the Commons, thank you very, very much for participating. Thank you all. That was really interesting. Thank you, Joyce. Bye, everyone. <laughs>